hear me. His cousin is American. Still see him. А вы что, собираетесь на ней жениться? Да. Ух, красота-то какая. Лепота. Таможня дает добро. Я вообще не называю меня, пожалуйста, Вероника. Кто я? Вот кто я? Отныне... Русские земля единый быть. Hi, my name's Ali, and this is the Rus Files Unite podcast where we watch Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I'm joined by a guest, and today I have a returning guest, Nadja B. Hi, Nadja. Hi, Ali. Thanks for joining me again. So for listeners who haven't caught your previous episode, on which we discussed kidnapping Caucasian style or prisoner of the Caucasus, depending on which title you want to go with, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first of all, I think since we last talked about that wonderful film, the bear song has been running around my head pretty much all the time. It's just so lovely. Oh, it's quite the earworm, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> in the best possible way. It really is. It's a very happy earworm. And, and since then, well, I've continued watching uh, Russian movies. And over, over Christmas, it was wonderful because there were so many films to see and I caught up especially with you know Christmas films New Year films um, and, and and just the joy of youth and uh, <laughs> I found out that really the more you watch these films the more you see that that it's full of quite rebellious young people despite mm. the seriousness at the time of, of life the regime the post-war period and so on that it's quite exuberantly joyful. Yeah, that is something that surprises me, you know, just as I've gone along doing this this podcast is, you know, growing up in the West, you have certain stereotypes about what life must have been like in the Soviet Union and kind of by extension, therefore, what all Soviet art must be like. And sure, like quite a lot of Eisenstein and kind of earlier Soviet films are quite serious and kind of frowny face and propagandary, not exclusively, but there is more of that earlier on. But kind of once you got into the 50s and 60s, at least on film, things did seem to kind of chill out quite a bit more. And that's something that hasn't really kind of like necessarily filtered through to kind of like the popular imagination. But yeah, so um, in terms of stuff you've been up to, uh, you have a new-ish film website, is that right? Absolutely. Uh, so with my film buddy, Victoria, Victoria Namova, we, we founded Kino Select. And, and really it's driven by the knowledge that there's so many films that we will never see And we need to work our way through it and share the ones that we especially love. So we thought Kino by name, select by nature. <laughs> oh, so, indeed. Yeah. So, so it's, been, it's been a great adventure. And we've also been experimenting with different styles of film reviewing. Um, and Victoria, for example, has written some beautiful movie musings in addition to the reviews. Um, we also did a fair bit of festival um, reporting, the Berlinales, London Film Festival, and so on. So we keep plugging at it, and it's just writing, writing, writing. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very cool. And it's, it's funny, this probably won't come out for a little while, but literally today there was an article that kind of blew up where Martin Scorsese was talking about the importance of curating films and and you know using one's knowledge of films to kind of show you know film lovers in general this is some of the stuff that's out there that you might not know about rather than just having film lovers be maybe not necessarily brilliantly served by the algorithm 
because the algorithm is going to be generated partly by what you've already watched and therefore won't necessarily like challenge you or show you stuff that you might really love but you don't know about it yet because you haven't seen things that are similar so yeah no you're providing a really like wonderful service kind of does it down but like it's really great to have a, a forum for you know sharing your enthusiasm and directing people to some really excellent films so yeah yeah and Keep also oh thank you because i think the thing that we did and we're a bit ahead of the times in that we decided we wouldn't be too time bound or driven by release dates because that's quite a breathless thing um and we just thought, let's talk about all sorts of other films, including the films that are coming out now. But, you know, let's not just be driven purely by that. Yeah, it can be a bit of a treadmill, can't it? It really can be. And also, the thing that I've always felt is that with, you know, with, with freshly released films only appearing in cinemas, I felt that that discriminated really against a lot of people who couldn't actually get into a cinema, maybe childcare, maybe disability and so on. And now with streaming reaching um, a footing of equality with new cinema releases, you know, I, I think that's a, it's a great development. Whether you're at home or you go to the cinema, you should be able to, be, to talk about the same films a week it comes out, for example. So I, ho- I, I hope that continues. Yeah, and you wonder whether post-pandemic, I mean, that feels like a very long time, way off yeah. at this time whether there will be I don't know I, I only hope but there'll be more room on screens for older films that people might not have had the chance to see on a big screen that's something certainly it seems like if you live in London or one of the big metropolitan centres you'll probably have a fair bit of that already especially London but outside it does seem to be very much you know, just what's what's new and therefore, quote unquote, exciting. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the landscape has changed uh, when things like, return to some semblance of normality. Before we started the call, you mentioned that there was something else rather exciting that you were working on. Uh, so what was that? So, you know, I have a background as a documentary filmmaker, uh, you know, for broadcast documentaries. But recently, I, I've been working on, on social history projects and, and, and you know, landscapes as palimpsests almost. And then I realized that the best medium to, to translate this new project into would be allying augmented reality and virtual reality. So, so this is, this is my, my, my new venture, my new learning. And it's, you know, having started a career working, you know, on actual physical film, like 16 mil, <laughs> um, it, it, it's now, you know, um, not only digital, but really trying to, how to say, to, to learn how to create stories that are really compelling with a new medium in, in a completely different way. And, and that's a wonderful exploration for me, um, especially because the, the, the topic of my project is, is a, a sort of a rabbit hole in itself. So, you know, if you invite me again to one of the uh, podcasts, then I might be able to tell you more about it as I've progressed. Okay, yeah, sure, definitely. Definitely we'll have to have to ask that next time around. So, yeah, no sneak peeks or spoilers at this point, or is it just not quite far enough along yet? Um, let's say that it's condensing over a thousand years of history into one place. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> that's quite a task. Yes, <laughs> it is. Awesome. Okay, so um, before we introduce the film that we're going to be watching today, uh, I just wondered whether there was anything that you had seen recently that you were particularly excited about and would want to let other people know about. Yes, I and I think it very much in the context of, of the film we're going to discuss. And, and I have quite strong feelings about this film because I saw it at the Berlinale almost years ago in 2019, and it, it's it's called Me Wieder Schlafen, and it's by a director called Pia Frankenberg. And, 
you know, it's a small group of women who find themselves in Berlin uh, for a wedding celebration just after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, you know, reunification, reunification of Germany. And they go on a bit of an adventure, but they don't know where they're going. And I think there are some parallels with, with the story we're going to discuss today. But there are two things about it that really struck me. First of all, the film received unfairly in an unfairly bad review at the time uh, in the early 90s when it originally came out. And then it disappeared. And it disappeared for, you know, well, almost 30 years. Yeah, better part of three decades, yeah. Yeah, and there's a parallel with the film we're going to discuss today, since that film too got completely slated by one guy who was mm. disgruntled, um, judgmental. To and put it, was, it mildly. You know, it, to put it mildly. And, and then the other parallel is that that film also had a female director of photography. So in this case, there's a woman called Judith Kaufman, uh, whereas, of course, in the film we're going to discuss today, the DOP uh, was Margarita Pilikina. So, but I think your pronunciation would be better than mine. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It wouldn't count on it. But um, So could you, for those of us, uh, including myself, who's, whose German isn't so hot, what would be the English language title of that film? Never Sleep Again. There you go. Great. Okay, so we'll have to have to search that one out. Uh, okay, so the film that we'll be watching today, though, as you've already alluded to, has a kind of a slightly tortured history. It was conceived of in the very late 50s by the director Marlon Hutsiev, but it didn't actually come out until 1965, so like a very long kind of gestation period. And it was originally going to be called, um, I haven't written the Russian title down, but it was it was going to be Illich's Gate. And basically it fell foul of Khrushchev, the uh, general secretary and essentially the, the, the leader of, of the Soviet Union at the time. And yeah... Um, he described it as morally sick, which, you know, pretty pretty strong words. So, as you might imagine, that didn't see the light of day for a little while. And in fact, when it did come out, it came out in a truncated form. It's still quite a long film. It's, uh, it's about two hours 45, but the original version was more like three hours. And, and it had a new name. And the version that we are watching is, is called I Am 20. So, those who who caught your previous episode, Nadja, uh, will know that this is a particular favourite of, uh, of yours because you, you, you mentioned it on, on that episode. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, you a bit more. What's your history with this film? Like, how did you come to see it for the first time and why is it such a favourite? A good question. And I had to think really hard because it's been so long since I've seen that film. And, and I think it was in the early 90s, quite a long time ago. And I think I may have seen it on television late, late at night. Oh, wow. Yes. So in the, in the uh, maybe I saw it in the 80s. So television in the UK in the 80s and in the early 90s, they were really good at putting all of the film classics late at night. And I think a, a lot of people gained their film education from television, which now sounds a bit, well, it, it's, less, it's less the case, I would say, in, in, in some respects. Yeah, because of the, the you know, proliferation of zillions and zillions of channels, there's, there's more like speciality channels for people who are into film, whereas... Yeah, back then it would just be, you know, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when premieres of big blockbusters, when they came, you know, they came on the TV sort of like three or four years down the line was a big, big deal. And I feel like that's not nearly as big a deal these days because stuff is, you know, way easier to get hold of. Indeed. And, and at the time, the Russian films, or the, you know, the, the really good films, let's say, they were most of the time shown by artificial eye. And certainly all the Tarkovsky films and so artificial eye, which is now part of, you know, Curzon, 
Um, but at, the, at that time, Curzon were actually showing more mainstream art house and artificial eye were, were, were showing the more sort of, you know, art with a big A, maybe, if one could say it like gotcha, that. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Yeah, and, and so it's a really different time. And the reason I think I saw it on television is because I don't think Artificial Eye bought that film. And I don't think it's part of their library. And so now I think, and one of the reasons that I think our discussion has been prompted this time is that because it's on Mubi. Yes, it surfaced. And I was like, aha! Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I'll finally get around to watching it. <laughs> absolutely. Um, you can edit this out if you want, and maybe it's evil of me, but I should also say that this film is also available on Amazon. And for, for one, £1.49 per episode. So, <laughs> so you know, if, 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 if one uh, source is too expensive or... or I don't know. In any case, there are two ways of watching the, seeing the film at the moment. Yes, in the UK. <laughs> in the yeah, UK yeah. At, at the moment. Yeah, so that's that. And then I lost track of what I was thinking or saying. So just talking more about your history with it, having seen it on, on TV, what was it that really grabbed you about this film? So really powerfully, and it's because it's a bit of an antidote to the other, you know, great, great figure in my life, or, you know, one of the great figures of cinema in my life, Tarkovsky. And, and the, inter the interesting thing is that, from my perspective, Hutsia manages to do everything that Tarkovsky does, but without the mysticism, without the religion, and without maybe, maybe the nationalism. Maybe. Hmm. So, so it's it's maybe more pure, less ornamented. Gotcha. Equally moving. So, interestingly enough, if you're a purist of cinema without almost artifact, maybe Hutsiev can do for you more than Tarkovsky. But please, I, I, you know, Tarkovsky is a huge formative influence on me, and and. There's no end of admiration and love, you know, from my perspective, you know, for his work. But but Hussein achieves achieves something very, very powerful without all the stuff. Hmm. That's that's very interesting. Um and funnily enough, <laughs> we actually have Andrei Tarkovsky in this film, in front of the camera, in a in a supporting role. So just just from that sort of curiosity, like it's almost worth the price of entry to begin with for Tarkovsky fans seeing this other side of him. I mean, what an amazing performance as well. <laughs> well, I haven't seen it yet. I've seen the odd clip that he is in because I was curious. So I have seen seen those. Funnily enough, in his younger days, he, he almost looks like a, a, a young Viggo Mortensen. There's something very like chiseled about his, his face, but he's in this very, very supporting uh, supporting part. But yeah, so I'm kind of excited to see that as well, as well. It kind of seems like just the film world in the Soviet Union was was always quite a kind of close knit one, I think, because so many people studied film in Moscow. I mean, there, there were other places as well that you could learn your craft, but there did seem to be a lot of, you know, people being actors who who normally would be behind the camera. And like, I remember, oh, what's his name even? Uh, Yuri Nikulin. Yes. So speaking of Tar Tarkovsky, the uh, comic actor Yuri Nikulin, and he was also a clown as well. As yes. One of his one of his his jobs. But he has this very small part in Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev. So you know, small world. But anyway, completely. But but it, these 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 are you know what, what makes the pleasure of these films and and uh, Tarkovsky's performance in 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 the film we're going to discuss is in I am twenty. I mean. He's goofy, but also he really, the, the camera drinks him in. And it's quite interesting because it's a very noticeable performance. And the other director, very well known now, who's also in that film, is Andrei Konchalovsky. Ah, indeed, yes. Exactly. And who now has this new film out in the UK at the very moment, Dear Comrade, which only came out about two or three weeks ago. 
Yes, yeah, I read reviews of that, and that that looks very interesting and and impressive that he's still producing, you know, noteworthy and well reviewed films like well into his his seventies. Uh, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I really don't want to get into uh, stuff about his brother Nikita Mikhailkov because that's sort of another story. But, Indeed, uh, yes. yeah, <laughs> yes. Yes, less said the better. But anyway, yes, uh, I feel like we've probably set up the film enough for now. So what we'll do is we'll say what we always say at this point as we launch into the film, which is payechali, which means off we go or we're off. And the reason we say that is that's what Yuri Gagarin said when he was blasting off to become the first man in space. And that might actually have a connection with the film we're watching because it was uh, released just a few years after that. So, you know, maybe a bit of a stretch as a connection, but, you know, it's it's still kind of there. So without further ado, three, two, one. Bye, Bye And we're back. Nadja and I have just watched Mnyad Dvatset Liet. I am 20, directed by Marlen Hudsiev. And before we get into what we thought of the film, Nadja's just going to give us a quick summary of what the film is about. Not really a plot summary, because the film is not highly plot driven i think i think we can agree can't we not agreed yes <laughs> but all the same if you haven't watched it yet and are concerned about spoilers this is the time if you haven't already to pause the podcast watch the film and then you can come back to it without us giving the game away at all so without further ado over to you nadia what happens in the film well, it's Moscow, early 1960s, uh, at a time when um, you know, it's been uh, maybe just about 15 years since the end of the um, Second World War. Everything is shifting, everything is changing, and young people are confronting very different issues to those of, of their parents' generation. Um, and this young man, Sergei, uh, returns from army service, uh, moves back home, moves in back home, and tries to find his way in the world. Recaptures uh, you know, his friendships, um, goes back to work. But then what next? Indeed, yes. It's, it's kind of about him finding his way in the world, like post-army service, and not just like professionally but also in terms of his love life as well, because we do get his sort of, uh, I don't know, am I characterising this right? A sort of off-again, on-again romance, maybe. And more than that, you know, because at the beginning, he's, he's, he's on the lookout, right? At the beginning, he's trying to find a girlfriend and he's chatting up yes. young women. And, you know, perhaps he has a feeling that he's, you know, missed one stop because one of his best friends is already married or he has a child um, mm. and he's still living at home with his mother and his sister and really, you know, searching in a slightly haphazard way. Um, so, so you can see <laughs> that he's scanning the landscape, looking at the, looking at the girls or, you know, young women um, and, and then he does meet somebody. Yeah. Yeah, because there's almost like a hierarchy of main characters, because I think we can say that Sergei, played by Valentin Popov, is the, if there's a main character, it's him. But then there's his two friends. There's uh, there's Nikolai, played by Nikolai Gubenko. And then there's the one you've already mentioned, Slava, who is, uh, who is, the married friend who ha who has a child, and he is he is played by Stanislav Lubshin, and then probably the next main character you probably would have to say would be Sergei's 
new girlfriend that he meets during the course of the film, Anya, played by Mariana Vertinskaya. Yes, so there's kind of like one main character and then three like major supporting characters and then there's a whole bunch of other people. Yes, um, I, I would say that Slava's wife plays a very important role um, yes. in the story. In fact, she is, she, I would say she's the fourth friend. So the, the core trio might be the three young men, but Slava's wife has a legitimate place as part of that friendship. However, being the mother of the young child, that, that is the, the game changer, I think, there as well, because she's constrained by her caring activities. And that's mm. something that I found wonderful about Hutsev is that, you know, there might be, you know, the, the three, three young men at the center of the story, but all of the important women in their lives you know, Sergei's mother, his sister, and so on. They might not be central to the story, but they are essential. and They have an organic space in it, and they're not subordinate to the narrative. In fact, they are sometimes really um, key propellants of the story, um, especially mm. the dialogue between Sergei and his mother, because what she says then profoundly transforms what happens to him one night when he dreams. Yes, yeah. Oh my goodness, we could go off in so, so many so, we're going so to many different directions track. from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, well it back in. <laughs> I, yeah, no, no. It's it's really interesting how so, the female characters in the film, even if they don't have a ton of screen time, they they do somehow feel very fleshed out, which is it's very deft. I don't know. I don't know how how they manage it. I mean, it's it, it's obviously partly just you know really great performances, but you get a sense of them as people, even if you don't see them for very for very long. Yeah, very good observation on Lucia, Slava's wife, who has who has the young the young kid, because you really get a, a sense of like the imbalance of the the workload in terms of like how much of the caring responsibilities she's having to take on versus how much he's he's pitching in like there's just this like meeting up scene at Slava and Lucia's apartment where Seryozha uh, Sergei and Kolya Nikolai are are there as well and they and they're catching up <laughs> and it's it's just almost like embarrassing and kind of cringy just how how much slava is not helping yes it's so true and and it's intentional um Hutsiev there and and his fellow screenwriter uh, Gennady Shvalikov are acute and astute observers of of a shifting society in so many ways and, you know, there's also the moment when Sergei's sister rebuffs him, you know, tells him, you know, tells him off and, and says, you know, take care of yourself. I've got my own destiny. So <laughs> contrast this with the Tarkovsky films and what women are for in those films. And it is really interesting to see the difference and, and their behavior. Certainly in the Hutsia film, everybody, all, all the women are agents of their own destiny. They're self-reliant, um, but they're also emotionally, you know, very compact, very together, you know, sometimes extremely witty. And, and certainly in the case of Sergei, uh, his girlfriend Anya is, is, is wonderful at winding him up. Um, and when, <laughs> when you consider that, you know, there is melancholy tone to this, there's also, you know, wit and, and uh, irony and there's goofiness. And in fact, I think that, you know, as, as we've commented before, the most sort of <laughs> serious of film directors in his own films plays the role of a complete clown in this one, which is wonderful to watch. Yes, yeah, we'll definitely have to have to return to that as we've we flagged that up in the intro. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen all of Tarkovsky's films and I've only seen 
mirror the wants and I need to return to it. But yeah, in in Ivan's childhood mm-hmm. and Andrei Rublyov, the women in that feel kind of a bit like ciphers. They they don't really have a, a ton to do and you don't particularly get much of a sense of uh, their like interior life, certainly. But yeah, I, I, I kind of have to rewatch and w- indeed watch for the first time some of his later his later films to really be able to comment on yeah. that. Yeah, so, so the uh, later the films get, the more hysterical they become. Uh, I'm, I'm saying <laughs> hysterical, quote unquote, because I know it's a, it's, it's it's a very provocative term. But 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 in yes, his final yeah. film, Sacrifice, poor Susan Fleetwood is absolutely losing it wailing and, mm. and completely losing it and uh you know to, to a disturbing degree and that's almost the, the culmination <laughs> of, of of that particular genre of, of acting yeah and of course in stalker you have alissa freundlich mm-hmm. I mean, she gives a good performance, yeah. but then there's that whole weird bit where she falls on the floor and kind of like writhes around in kind of very exaggerated agony, which, I mean, it's a sci-fi film, so you can kind of excuse some kind of, uh, I guess, over-the-top sort of weirdness. It kind of goes, can go with the genre, certainly, but in, yeah. In Solaris yes. too. In Solaris, there's there's also that extreme emotional dependency and inability to go. In in fact, there, you know, that that's the thing that haunts and traumatizes the the, the hero, um, Chris Kelvin. It's, it's that Natalia Bondarchuk, isn't it? Um, where where yes, you know, yeah. there's again the the writhing and and the the inability to exist without the man. Mm. So, so which you know, in real life, these things do happen. Um, but it's a recurring thing. Yeah, 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 and yeah, you're definitely right to to bring up the contrast in in this film because you definitely, or at least I definitely get the feeling that Anya, while she's very attracted to Seryozha, can kind of take take him or leave him. Yes. Yes, and and she's so playful with it. Uh, there's that lovely staircase scene. You know, he walks her back home, and then um, you know he does want to follow up the stairs. And there's that lovely game, and then it's mirrored later. Mm, oh, this film does like a good staircase. <laughs> it, it really does. It really does. So yes, it, it's. I guess. Perhaps since we're talking about women, we can talk about the um, the director of photography on this film. Yes, yeah, Margarita Pilichina. Yes, remarkable. I've, I've been trying to find all the films that she's actually photographed. Unfortunately, she died young. Oh, did she? Yeah, mm. I was going to say because I had a quick look mm. on on Letterbox, and she hadn't done a a ton of films, and I was kind of like. That's a surprise because yeah. this this is so visually striking mm. Mm. And, and and so robust and so energetic mm. physically because this is really the um, they're constantly on the move constantly on the streets you know so the camera is 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 dancing throughout the film and and you can see that they would have had of course to plan things and that you know from time to time you can see that the artificial lighting is unintentionally perhaps very occasionally more visible would have expected but, but it, it's it's a remarkable remarkable film in in that respect first of all because i think we, we are aware of only a few uh, female um GOPs from that era but she she died in 1975 so, oh gosh! So yeah, only ten years after this film was finally released. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. So that that would explain it. But yeah, it's it's so striking visually. There's lots of lots of long takes. It reminds me a bit of the Mikhail Kalatozov films. I I forget the uh, the name of his his like main cinematographer. It isn't quite as smooth as that but it does have that kind of like often 
the camera travels up to a great height or comes in from a great height and then down into the scene and it's it, it is just it is very striking also there's an interesting use of use of close ups mm-hmm. because there's several instances of where a character is is looking like straight at you as the viewer it's not to break the fourth wall in the sense of the character then talking to you as an audience member but they are looking st- straight at you in several instances like i think it's the first time we see serioja's mother we see her just as as she's about to see him for the first time after he comes back and she just is beaming but it's kind of like very straight on and i found that quite striking yes and 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 it's it's really a reminder of of older films (laughs) actually when you think of the eisenstein films there's that framing you know, and you see it a lot in 1920s films. I'm, I'm thinking also of the Bunuel films as well. Okay, yes, I really need to need to see some of this. <laughs> yes, so so it's looking straight ahead, but as you say, not breaking the illusion. You know, not breaching the wall, and in in a way, it it just gives it a greater interiority. It's almost as if we're getting into their head. We're not acknowledged, but yeah, but we we get to see, you know, a bit more of their, as you say, their what's going on in their head, their their emotions, and their emotions as like perceived by the other person who, who's in the scene. Usually, in this case, Serioja. Yes, and it's there's the old. Sorry, I was going to say it's it's very intimate. Mm, definitely, mm. definitely. Uh, I guess this is still probably file under the visual aspect, but you know, there's the cliche about the city as a character yes. within many films. This has that in spades, but it also, it's not just the city and the architecture, which is very much part of it, but it's also almost the rest of the inhabitants of the city very much feel like part of the ensemble cast. Yes. In a, in a way that they're, they're not just like extra bodies there. You kind of, it's hard to say exactly how, but you kind of get a sort of an energy. So it feels too nebulous and pretentious a word. But the fact that you get like snippets of conversations in passing that just convey a bit more of the atmosphere. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He, he's bottling something. He's bottling the feel of the time. And... Because uh, you're absolutely right with the snippets. And I think one of the reasons that the film is so incredibly evocative and vivid, it's it's the soundtrack together with the filming. Absolutely. So, you know, as we're saying, the, the, the camera roams, you know, quite freely and notices and, and you know, engages. And then continuously there's that really rich, densely packed soundtrack. The the soundtrack never stops and it's hopping around, um, you know, between sound and music and conversations. It's really weaving. It never, ever stops. It works at such a subconscious level that I think that that's why, you know, what we were doing at some point before we started talking we were listening together to the sound um, and disregarding for a few moments the images. And as we were doing that, a whole world was being recreated, I felt. Um, and, and also because of the richness of the soundtrack, which is culturally incredibly cosmopolitan. Mm, yes, it's incredibly eclectic. As you've got yes. French language songs, you've got of course, you've got Russian, as you'd anticipate, but there's English language. And as you say, before we we started recording, we were talking about how how much stuff there is from the West and how the Iron Curtain, at least musically and culturally, more porous than you might think in this period. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think, um, I, I don't know how many people realise this, but, you know, because there were the two major power blocks and, you know, the Iron Curtain and so on, what happened is, is that, you know, 
each of the two bigger empires were attracting and, and culturally seducing, I would say, young people from all over the world um, and also offering grants for studies and so on. So, so you have a, a lot of uh, Russian trained doctors or Soviet trained doctors, perhaps one would say, from sub-Saharan Africa, from Southeast Asia and so on. And both in, in, let's say, in Paris in the West, or, you know, less than the United States, but in Moscow, you see all of these foreign students, all of these foreign young people and great cultural exchanges. And so that was occurring all over the world, whether you were on one side or the other of the Iron Curtain at the time. And then Hutsev really makes this apparent through his choice of music. Mm. And, and you do see in the background, you see, um, you know, foreign students walking in the street and, 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 and so on as well. So you're aware that it's not, that it is a cosmopolitan world. Yes, yeah, that it's not this kind of completely closed off place. And yes, certainly the authorities are kind of doing that on their own terms and with very much the motivation of like, well, if we bring people in, then we can then send them back out as kind of like almost like missionaries for communism because they can go, oh, wow, look how great Moscow is, you know, uh, and kind of it's a way of extending their soft power. And then eventually, like the authorities will be hoping their harder, harder power in terms of, you know, who's who's running those countries and what their sympathies are. But yeah, it's definitely you get the sense of it being like very much an international hub and and besides the students that we incidentally see in the crowds there's actually a a point at Sergei's work where a Ghanaian delegation is being shown around <laughs> and one of Sergei's bosses gets quite frustrated with him because his mind's clearly not on his work and He's concerned that Sergei is kind of showing them up in front of this delegation who's come to see just how well stuff runs in the Soviet Union. Indeed. <laughs> in, in, indeed. It's like, you're not putting our best foot forward here. I mean, it's not quite as explicit as that. but de 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 Definitely. And, and, and then this internationalism is also reflected, I feel, in in filmmaking. So when we think of the French Nouvelle Vague, when, when, when is um, Breathless made? Well, I think two or three years before I am 20. I think, you know, so it's 1960. Yeah, so I guess this was, this was in production then because obviously the, the release was delayed for the censorship reasons that we, that we mentioned. In 62. Uh, in the... Yeah. Yeah, 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 you know, absolutely. But had the wider release in 60, 65, like it actually, that was when it actually got into cinemas in the, the recut. slightly shorter version. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that we're watching, yeah. And then another Western influence that was remarked upon, I think in David Gillespie's book on Russian cinema was Italian neorealism yes. and very much the we're going to kind of capture the city as it goes about its business. And my understanding from, from the comments in that book was that a lot of the crowd scenes, they're not extras. They're just people like who are just caught on camera, just going about their business <laughs> rather than we've set this up. So that's, yeah, definitely gives the film that extra uh, authenticity, I guess. And we, we can't discount the influence of news camera people from the Second World War and also uh, during the Spanish Civil War. So, so you, 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 you can see a um, continuity of, of uh, style and techniques because it's really, it is a form of, of almost photojournalism. Uh, when, when you look at all the street scenes, the parades, and, and so on, there's a whole load of influences uh, that, that work together. And also these films were only possible to specific types 
thanks to specific types of, of camera cameras that were portable, um, that could be easily loaded and reloaded, you know, with 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 film that that is when when you think of how much infrastructure is required usually in a feature film in terms of lighting and, and, and just to light a scene. And, and then what uh, in this film Margarita Felixina is doing, she's constantly rushing from dark areas to light areas. It's constantly changing around her. And she's adapting to all these changing conditions, almost as what, you know, they're on the move. And, and that's really, you know, documentary filmmaking or almost news filmmaking of a kind. And so this is, this is, you know, a development in itself. Mm. Yeah, something I noticed as well was just how much shooting goes on in the rain and it makes it look very, like, Moscow in the rain is not actually nice, but you wouldn't know it from this film because it makes it look very romantic and lovely. Yes. (laughs) When it's kind of like any big city in the rain, it's it's kind of mucky and not very nice. But this film makes it just look so atmospheric and gorgeous. Yes. Um, but it also seems like it's raining all the time, which my recollection is is that it tends to be a bit more like short, very sharp, absolute downpours, mm. and then it stops. Again, this was the five years and, you know, my memory being as reliable as it <laughs> is. Listeners will know it's sometimes a bit fickle, but yeah, uh, my recollection is that you didn't particularly get the days in the way that you get in this part of the UK where it just rains all day. It seemed to be much more like you get an hour of very intense rain and then it it clears up. But this this film makes it seem almost like as ra- rainy as London, but yeah. in a much more kind of romantic, glistening kind of magical way. Yeah, very true. But but I'm smiling because um, if if you didn't say what the film was, and if you told you know a third party, I've just seen the Russian film and it was raining constantly. The whole there was so much water in it, they would say, oh, you know, a Tarkovsky film. Mm. <laughs> and it's not in this instance, but it's a theme. That's true. He does like his rain as well. <laughs> <laughs> so much water, as a friend of mine said, <laughs> after I dragged them to see um, a Tarkovsky film. So, so the technology is very recent, when, when they're making that film. It's really only in the 50s that it, you know, fast film star, lightweight cameras, you know, and also the sound, because the, the, the sound, again, had to, everything had to be portable. And uh, it's, it's, it's a recent development when, the, when they're there. So the, if now it feels like a bit, you know, so what, in, in the years of, in the age of everybody being able to film really good stuff on a mobile phone. Right. Yeah, that's a completely, completely different thing. Yeah. Yeah, I would say one like drawback that people will perhaps notice, mm-hmm. and maybe this is my ver- version, but you might be able to comment on mm-hmm. this as well, is that is that occasionally like the redubbing of of the dialogue mm-hmm. is is a little bit obvious, mm-hmm. just like characters. <laughs> characters' mouths not really syncing up with with the dialogue is is noticeable on some some scenes, and that's a that's a bit of an imperfection, obviously. But it's yeah, it's it's more noticeable in some scenes than others. What, what's interesting about this is is how common that was at the time, and and Godard actually really made something of it as well. I mean, there he actually has he has characters speaking directly to the audience, so there he really does 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 break the the, the wall. But at the same time, you know, the, the, the dialogue on purpose sometimes sounds, you know, it's inaudible. In a way, you start paying attention to, to sound by noticing the sort of quit and quit flaws in it as well, the texture of it. Yeah. Speaking of texture, another thing I definitely feel like we should mention is the amount of poetry that's dropped in. Yes, yes. This, again, I didn't find this too disorientating, 
because of you know like my relative relative ability at, at Russian to disting- distinguish different voices, oh. but. I did find in some of the scenes I could see why it might be disorientating because you've got dialogue, but it's also interspersed with like poetry reading, and the styles are quite distinct because there's there's a way of reading poetry yeah. in Russian that does seem quite like stylized and performative versus the more naturalistic conversations, yeah. but it is it is something that's very striking <laughs> in in this, and you even get like. Sergei and Anya go to a poetry reading, <laughs> so it's even like it's it's di- it's diegetic, but it's in some in some other places in the film the the poetry reading is non diegetic, so yes. it's it's quite a mix. But it does show how much poetry was valued, and even to an extent, like from my recollections of Moscow, it. Did seem something that differentiated Russia with with the the West is that poetry does seem to be a thing that lots of people are still into in a way that it feels much more niche over here. Um, maybe that's just the <laughs> just the difference between living in in the capital city versus living like somewhere more provincial in the UK. But yeah, I don't know. It does seem like poetry is a bigger deal in in russia than than it is here yes, now yes no I, I, absolutely and and that that brings to mind two two things um first of all with 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 the sound the thing is that um i couldn't find any any information about the circumstances in which they they, they filmed uh, i am 20 especially with you know street scenes and so on but a film like breathless for example Everything was filmed in silent mode. They, they didn't record the sound when they were doing uh, the song. Oh, okay. And then it was dubbed afterwards. And when you see the Italian films, again, the, the dubbing is really, really obvious. But what Hutsiev is doing with that, and as you say, you know, dropping in the poetry and, and um, all of these elements, and what you say about poetry being so much more important there, that is actually the central thing for me because that's how um, I think it's one of the reasons I especially love that film and it really struck me. And it's because I was primed for it and I was, I was primed for it and I had a sense of overwhelming recognition when I saw the film because when I had been much younger, I had read the autobiography of a Russian writer called Konstantin Paustovsky. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's not a name I'm familiar with, to be honest. But it's it's interesting. A lot of people say that to me, and and I think maybe he was less translated in the uh, Anglo-Saxon mm. world. But um, as you probably know, under the Soviet Union, first of all, there was no copyright. I mean, they didn't subscribe to the International Convention on Copyright, and they were publishing a lot and distributing worldwide a lot of of books uh, of all sorts, including literature, and uh, a lot of works, in, including the works of this, this Russian writer, and it translated into French. And, and I think it was, I think it was Gallimard in France who published this, this uh, writer's memoirs. And he describes these iconic scenes, well, they've now become iconic, but they were quite ordinary for him, I guess. And, and this includes the poetry readings. And it was a completely normal thing of life. I, I, w- I would guess mm. like young people now, I don't know. What do young people do nowadays? <laughs> the newest generation, <laughs> the people younger than you or than me? Um, what's a favorite pastime? Well, anyway, it had been poetry, yeah. Yeah, I I must say, watching this film in a time of social distancing and trying to stay at home and away from people uh, as much as possible, it it, it it was quite a weird experience just because so much of this film takes place in crowded places with, with lots of yes, people. Yes, <laughs> and they're dancing, and they're dancing in the street, and then they break into song, all of that. Mm, 
Yeah, yeah. And then the like the apartment party at the end uh, as well. It's it it was kind of like on the one hand it was really nice, but also it just felt like quite like unnatural and sort of like oh, shouldn't these people be <laughs> be staying further apart? Oh no, no, it's fine. <laughs> That's yes. <laughs> life was life was normal then. <laughs> no, de- definitely, definitely, yes. But um, in Paustovsky's memoirs, he, he talks about times of epidemic war. Mm. Oh, and in okay. fact, I think that's why, where he, he loses his, his um, partner, who's a, a doctor, and, and she dies as, mm. as part of that epidemic. One little fact about this writer, because I, I want to promote him now, uh, in the world. Um, he went to school with Mike, Mikhail Bulgakov. They were classmates. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. So, yes, could you uh, run his name by us yes. again? Konstantin Paustovsky, uh, born in Moscow, grew up in in Ukraine, and then and then he uh, it's during the First World War. Uh, he became a paramedic on a hospital train, and then oh, he saw a lot. You know, in terms of what happened uh, on the front and then the early years in Moscow, you know, of course, after the revolution uh, and then trying to make his, his life. And then he writes as well. And his most famous book, I think, is his autobiography called A Story of a Life. But in fact, there are two volumes and I think maybe the volume was called something else. Okay. I mean, speaking of the revolution Mm -hmm. this film does seem to have quite a complex and ambiguous relationship with the prevailing ideology of the Mm -hmm. time shall we say because on on the one hand you see the you see like a big parade and there's this kind of like slightly like it feels quite hagiographical like visiting of i mean we don't go inside obviously but we've the camera sort of like visits lenin's mausoleum Mm -hmm. on on red square but we do get this sort of like it kind of bring up i think in one key scene you've got sergey's friend kolya has a confrontation i think we can say with a colleague Mm -hmm. Basically, this colleague gets Kolya on his own and then is asking some very probing questions about uh, another colleague who's like relatively senior, we can deduce from the dialogue. But this colleague of Kolya's who's who's kind of almost almost interrogating him, the subtext seems to be that he's like a KGB or like a plant of the security services within Collier's organization. And they're basically trying to find dirt on this other member of the, of the workforce. Cause it seems like this third person, I forget the name of, of the guy, but it seems like he's quite vocal and, you know, will share his opinion. And it seems like the authorities don't like that. And Collier is essentially being pressured to come up with something that will get this guy in trouble. And Collier, it looks for a second like he's going to say something, but then he says he says to the to the guy who's who's trying to get this information out of him, like, essentially I would smack you in the face, but <laughs> I'd want to do it so that there'd be witnesses. <laughs> And then as a result of this, he feels terrible that he's been es- essentially put in this position. And he's trying to talk to Sergei about this, Sergei and Slava, and they just don't seem to be that receptive. And it's all subtext as, as far as like what's going on. And it feels like, I don't know, to me anyway, I don't know how you felt, but it seemed like... Sergei is sort of trying to shrug this off and that that's what that it almost causes a rupture in their friendship. My my take on this was again there's this massive change socially 
where, where young people are no longer deferring to their elders, which was something that Khrushchev was mm. being infuriated about. But at the same time, it's a dangerous battle and easily lost. And Sergei, at that point in time, he wants to make his way in the world. He's quite different from his friends. You know, he's the one who has a one night stand. He's the one who is seeking freedom, but not confrontation, is, is how I saw him. Yeah, because it seems to be what he's saying in that exchange with Kolya is that it's not about the system. It's just that, you know, some people are, are, are just are just not nice people and it's always going to be like that. He doesn't, he's trying to, I guess, deny that that's, that it's a particular feature of that system. It's just, you know, people being a bit crap sometimes rather than it being to do with like state surveillance or whatever. And Collier seems to be like, you're being willfully, uh, <laughs> turning a blind eye to this and it's all it does seem like it's all it's all subtext and maybe i'm reading too much into i think it, it's but... very telling um subste- subtext ali and also i again sort of a little internal smile in my head as you were describing that 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 tension between these two interpretations of the same reality i was thinking of the film that i think we both like quite a lot by leonid gaidai about you know ivan the terrible visits moscow because the, mm. the building superintendent there is being equated to some degree with, you know, the big, you know, bad, terrible uh, despot. But at the same time, it's somebody completely ridiculously authoritarian. Um, and he has a lot of mm. control over the lives of the people in that apartment block. And there's a very strong political comment on it. But at the same time, satire. Yeah, yeah, it's it is interesting the the juxtaposition in that in that movie between Ivan the Terrible, who is portrayed as being incredibly dr- draconian and a sort of like all powerful, mm-hmm. versus you know his double in the present day, who is you know has a lot of influence but is also completely clueless at the same yeah. time and not nearly as like commanding and yeah, it, it, it's it's a very odd. Her like juxtaposition. Yeah, but. yeah, and I, and I wonder if there's an echo in that. In in that, you know, people may have undue power, but even when they do, some of it misuse it more than others might. Mm. Yeah, some people are maybe cogs in the system, but <sighs> perhaps don't like tattle on their colleagues as much as their bosses would ideally want them to maybe <laughs> um so the consequences some seem to relish in having that opp- opportunity True. yeah I mean, the consequences at the time would have been terrible for anybody who decided to confront things head on mm. yeah which is probably why, why collier is is struggling as as much as mm. as he is mm. but did you see collier then as somebody who is questioning the actual regime rather than its daily application? I think it's more the daily application because later on you get a scene where he's just going through the, the street and he's, it's weird, he's like talking to Lenin <laughs> as if like Lenin is a deity that he prays yes. to. He's just kind of like, oh, Lenin, Lenin, you know. I don't remember the, the details of it, but he's he's kind of almost like, offloading his problems to to with how the system is working in practice to Lenin. It's it's very odd. You're right. But the interesting thing about that is that that is actually the closing sequence of the film. It is the changing of the guard outside Lenin's tomb. And mm. and the film originally was called Leech's Gate, which I know is the name of an area, right. but I mean there is a there is a some kind of of reference to to Lenin and and I was wondering if that final scene isn't more a sense of reconciliation with the institution and and when you were saying you know for example Moscow is another character in the film I was I was almost wondering if the Soviet state was also another character in this film 
Yeah, I mean, quite possibly. Yeah. And it's interesting in terms of Sergei's relationship to the regime and the ideology of, of the Soviet Union is at the party, one of the other guests is kind of haranguing him and saying that his patriotism is like a bunch of like nonsense done for show. And then Sergei is trying to justify himself. And he's saying like, I take the revolution really seriously. Uh, I take the war seriously. But he specifically references that he thinks about the year 1937. And the significance of that year is that is the year of the height of the Stalinist purge. So the fact that he's even talking about that is like it doesn't develop that, but the fact that it's dropping in that reference and that's being acknowledged and it's being shown that this character in, well, at the time of shooting the film, in the early 60s, mm -hmm. knows about that and it's something that he's grappling with, I find is very interesting. Yes, yes, no, it, it, it is. And and it really is a critical time of change. And, and at the time, they, they didn't know that it would get clamped down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you'd have the the changing of the of the guard again, and then you had the Brezhnev era, and more of a, as you say, like clamping down on freedom of speech and like a kind of harder enforcement of like the party line and less discussion <laughs> about the crimes of the regime earlier on in the in the the Soviet Union's history. Definitely, it was the destabilization period, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, Khrush yeah, that was like a big thing about Khrushchev. But even though obviously he 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 had a an attitude about about this film and wasn't uh, wholly sat satisfied with how it went. This is this is interesting to me is that this film was released after Khrushchev was ousted by by Brezhnev. So it's kind of like almost counterintuitive that this film that would be it was suppressed by the guy who was more about openness, but it's released just after he's he's gone um but yeah. that when it was very early in the brezhnev era so. but if i just gather the threads of, of what we were saying uh one it's that the film is is quite openly anti-stalin or stalin's legacy isn't it and yeah. and then khrushchev was probably okay with things as far as the destalinization thing was going on but not about the rest so maybe there was a sort of you know, he didn't like the bundle, let's say. Yeah. And then yeah. when we're thinking about Brezhnev, it's under Brezhnev that we had get all these satires about, you know, authoritarianism and all these comedies that are constantly referencing, even sometimes quite subtly. I mean, you're in kidnapping Caucasian style, you even see a psychiatric nurse's Oh my goodness, yeah, we discussed that in the episode and the fact that it's kind of like, really, they're putting this yeah. in there despite the yeah. <laughs> This got through yes. when they're like basically shoving dissidents into psychiatric mm -hmm. hospitals and going, well, if you have a problem with the way things are, it clearly means it's a mental health issue. It's nothing to do with the actual way things are. My goodness. Yeah, it's it's really surprising that that made in it. In that light, the, the release of that film in 1965 is, I, I don't know, I, I wasn't there at the time. I'm not a specialist. But, but I can see that, that. And what is then not explained is how a film like The Commissar never saw the light of day. Also made in 67, I think. But then, you know, allegedly destroyed and then sees the light of day again much, much later. I think 1988. Yeah, during the glass. Oh, it was 67. Period, yeah. 67. Exactly, exactly. So, so during that period, certain, film, certain films or certain themes could get out, even if they were subversive. And in fact, it was almost like it was an open joke that everybody was in on. Mm, yeah, or that it was sort of allowed as a release yes, valve. Yes. But, but acknowledged. It means that people could look at each other and nod knowingly and have a laugh um, about the very things that were an issue, really. Yeah, there's a couple of specific scenes that I want to get into before we wrap this up. We have the scene with Sergei's mother 
randomly stumbling across a long misplaced ration card. I found that a very affecting yes, scene. Very much, very much. And it's a turning point. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Because she then talks about her memories of just living through that, living through the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union and the fact that they almost they they got to like within shooting distance of of Moscow and the just the panic and uncertainty of of living through yes. that and the fact that they lost this ration card and that meant that she uh, she was feeding an infant Sergei at the time and was having to try and get by without this ration card and then of course her husband Sergei's father is at the front yeah. and they don't know whether they're going to see each other again. And it transpires that they do one more time before he's then killed in action. But it's it's odd because the way that that sequence of her reminiscing is shot, it seems like Sergei's sister Vera, I think her name yes. is Vera, <laughs> is paying attention and he's kind of ignoring his mother and not really listening. But that's kind of not borne out in subsequent sequences. Correct. Yeah. So then, yeah, then we go to later on the party sequence. <laughs> we mm -hmm. have this business about toasts to potatoes, which is very strange. And then there's the uh, <laughs> there's an altercation with a character played by Andrei Tarkovsky, <laughs> who is just being just like a provocative jerk. <laughs> it's a really, really... Um... It's a funny scene. I think one of the things that really struck me in this this scene, overall scene, the party scene, and, you know, it happens when the camera is moving around, uh, there's lots of distracting sound, and, you know, it's sometimes you, you're at a party, everything's very, very busy, and you notice out of the corner of your eye that there's a little problem developing somewhere, but you don't quite capture it. And the day after you realise that it was actually something much bigger. Um, but, you know, that you grasped it, but you didn't fully grasp the implications. And in that scene, it's the potatoes. And the potatoes are really important. Yes, because Sergei is talking about, like, how, again, like, the film is referencing the story with his mother earlier on and surviving the war and the food shortages and the hardship. So Sergei is just feeling very serious about this, whereas the Tarkovsky guest character is just kind of like needling him about how silly this all seems. And playing with food. And, yeah. And the playing with food is, well, it's anathema. You know, people who experience starvation do not play with food. Um, it's, it's sacrilege. Yeah, in, in a way, and and through through that, you realise that the reaction of somebody getting really angry, but you only just glimpse it about the playing with precious food. It brings you back to everything that shapes that generation. Yeah, 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 and and what their parents yes. went through, and the stories that they will have. Told. The foundational reality of their lives. But now it's different. And their big problem at that point in the early 60s is how to be a person and make their way in that life. It's, mm. It becomes an existential rather than a survival problem. And that's possibly generationally what divides the before and after. Yes. And, and I think we should probably move on to the connected with that the the ghost scene yes. uh which is almost the last thing that happens and this is something you talked about on the previous episode that you that you were on when you were when you were talking about i am 20 but it's it's such a i don't want to say chilling in the sense of like it's not like a ghost scene out of a horror film but it is very poignant and there is definitely a kind of uncanniness to it it's it's really it's really well done yes yes it, I, w I would call it a transcendent moment and, and a moment of truth, a moment of discovery and also maybe of reconciliation. 
Yeah, I'm still not quite sure how to wholly read it, because on the one hand, Sergei's father, who we learn died in the war, like basically comes to see him in his kind of hour of, you know, just kind of not knowing what he's doing with his his life. And Sergei is saying, you know, I've just longed for this moment and, you know, please tell me, you know, what should I be doing with my life? And his father's is saying, you're older than I was when I, when I died. So I don't have anything I can really share with you. You're going to have to figure this out for yourself. He doesn't say that in so many words, but that, that was my interpretation of how that went. Yeah, I don't know what your how you felt about it and what your thoughts were. Um, I think the first thing to say is that it's just incredibly beautiful. It is just so beautiful. And there's a sense of heightened quite emotion there, which is very powerful. And I've only seen it in one other film in my life. Again, a dialogue between just two people and it's very quiet. And there's that, you know, that, 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 that very gentle intensity. And it's a film by um, American French filmmaker called Eugene Green. Okay. It's made many years later, but it's such a rare scene in cinema, so unique. And and really, that's where the, there's, there's a moment of reckoning. And what the father is saying, I believe, is something possibly that any good loving father would have said at any time even if he had stayed alive, even if he had accrued decades of wisdom. And it's in the loveliest way possible to say, trust yourself. Only you know, and it, it's for you to create your future. Yeah, I also, I also wondered whether there was like an implied gentle rebuke there in that Sergei is kind of like, tearing himself apart about like his place in the world mm. and all that kind of thing. But it's like his father is almost saying, well, yes, finding your way in the world is hard, but at least you get to experience it, you know, like almost like my life was cut short before I had to really reckon with that stuff. Maybe I'm reading far too much into it, but I did wonder whether that was there too. I think that I agree with what you're saying in the sense that I think it's actually the filmmaker saying this. Yes, maybe rather than the father. Because the, the camera tracks over the sleeping faces of the father's companion in arms. And then the yes. son says, are yeah. they alive or are they dead? And it's very ambiguous when you look at these sleeping people there, whether they're alive or dead. Right, and then the father like goes to to talk about their their yes. fates. Like, yes. it's kind of like, well, in this moment that you, Sergei, have been transported back mm -hmm. to, they are alive. But in two weeks or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, this this one is going to die over here. This other one gets to mm -hmm. this place, and and then is and then is cut down. And you're just kind of like. Oh my goodness! Just, just the, the living in a society where such a huge chunk of the generation before just wasn't around anymore because of the because of what happened in the war. Mm. It's it, it's it's just very emotionally affecting, and it's 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 odd because this clearly isn't a war movie in any way, but it's just very much kind of like that like emotional like legacy yes. <laughs> it's just kind of like woven it's in it's shaped by it it's really shaped by it mm. yeah. yeah like and the fact that the, the the very first sequence is these three soldiers going off to war and i wasn't quite sure how to read that whether that's uh because obviously sergey himself has done military service but my looking back on it i was kind of like i think and you don't really see the soldiers faces for very mm. long i thought okay this is this is a flashback to to the 40s but it's it, i didn't think it was spelt out but yeah 
Uh, <laughs> I feel like we've we've probably been uh, recording long enough that, that just like uh, my brain is fizzling out. <laughs> but there's just so much to deal with in this film. It's it's very it's very dense and it's very rich. It's and gorgeous. I definitely need to give it a rewatch. It, it's gorgeous. Uh, I think that it's one of those films that you can see many times again. Um, it's interesting because I feel that it's profound about. In a way, also the freedom to be a bit frivolous. You know, you're young, you want mm. to dance, you want to have one night stands, you want to listen to jazz, um, you want to argue with your supervisor, you want to be free. Um, probably you do not want to have a child at that age. And we can see that there's that gorgeous little baby who, who you know, was probably had by its parents a bit too young. Um, and that, that's life changing for their relationship. Yes, yeah, because because Slavo like whines whines about like how difficult his marriage is now, but it's also like he doesn't come across very well in that in that sequence. It's like yeah, probably because you're not helping enough. But then when you're twenty, but anyway, I when guess. you're twenty, having a baby is you know tough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Like it's tough at any time, mm. but like when all your peers are just having a great time being free and single, having that level of responsibility thrust onto you is probably even harder to take. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Um, I feel like we've... There's so much that you could potentially discuss in this film. There's yes. so much going on. It's it's kind of like, it's, it's... I mean, with any film that's nearly three hours, it's kind of an epic but in a sort of a different way to the you 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 you, you know many films that are three hours. In its um, defense, it's in two parts. <laughs> that's yes, <laughs> yes. There would have been an there would have been an interval, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I think we should probably wrap things up. But Nadia, thank you so much for bringing this film to my attention and uh, like giving me the occasion to watch it as. I've really enjoyed it. I think possibly the discussion has made it seem like that it's all heavy and all serious all the time, but you were very right to point out that there's plenty of fun and joy in there as well. It's not all just like heavy existential like angst. So yeah, if anyone was put off by watching it, I would say, no, that's definitely part of it, but it's it's fun too. Yes, it's about being young. It's about being gorgeous. Uh, at one point, we see the hero without his shirt on. Oh my goodness, <laughs> everyone is everyone is so good looking, aren't mm. they? <laughs> they? Dance, they sing, they play around. Yeah. Yeah, highly recommend it. So before we go then, mm -hmm. Nadja, is there anywhere that's people can find you online if they want to get in touch and find out about the other films that you would recommend. Uh, where can you be found online? So I can be found on kinoselect.com. Uh, that's Kino with a K to start with, but at the select, it's a C, not a K. And I'm also on Twitter and it's at Nadia B. Kinophile. And at Nadia B, it's D with a J afterwards, not an I. Yeah, important distinction yeah. there. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, thank you again. This has been really fun. And thank you, listeners, for... I was going to say tuning in, but that's that's probably because I've been watching a film from the 60s with lots of radio. But thank you for taking the time to listen. And das Vidania, folks. Das Vidania. So that's it for this episode, but before I go, I'd like to thank Sasha Ilukovic and the Highly Skilled Migrants for the use of their song Cold in our intro. You can find that song and the rest of their back catalogue on Bandcamp and Spotify. If you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting us by leaving a rating at Apple Podcasts or at podchaser.com. That second one, Podchaser, even lets you rate individual episodes, so if this episode particularly stood out to you, you can let other listeners know that you enjoyed it. Recommending the show on social media is hugely helpful as well. If you can spare a moment or two to do that, it would really make my day. Thank you, thank you very much. Speaking of social media, 
please find us and say hi on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. You can also drop us a line at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, take care of yourselves, and bye for now. Okay, so a quick message before I go. If you're enjoying the Roos Files Unite movie podcast, there are a couple of ways you can help to cover the cost of running the show, if that's something you're able to do. The first option is donating roughly the price of a cup of coffee on our Ko-Fi page. The address for that is www.ko-fi.com slash Unite. Also, there is rusandsov.com, that's R-U-S-A-N-D-S-O-V dot com, where you can get t-shirts, wall posters, coffee mugs, and more with a Soviet and or Russian theme. If you use the promo code RUSAFILESUNITE, that's all caps and all one word, at checkout, you'll get 10% off, and they ship locally in the US, EU, and Australia. Again, you'll find the links in the show notes. That's all from me. Take care and stay safe.